Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Unfunk Your Gut seminar. And uh, I see the doctor is already logged on. How are you doing tonight, sir? Good. Good afternoon. Or good evening. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Beautiful Zoom setup in the background. I love it. I love it. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and everyone else, we're going to mute you here just on your way in. I know we're not even at seven o'clock yet, but uh, this is being recorded this evening. So uh, we would ask you again to please mute yourselves on the way in. If you've got questions, I understand Dr. Kozlowski will be able to answer some questions for you at the end uh, tonight. So we're looking forward to having him present. I am going to go ahead and uh, allow him to share his screen. So as soon as we get underway here, we'll uh, switch over to him to be the presenter because as some of you already know at Exit, I am a gas relief specialist. I'm certainly not a gut health specialist. I want to be stopping to take so much of those uh, those stomach relief pills. And for everyone that uh, is gonna be joining us here in a minute and will probably wanna catch the playback, um, what we are doing in our uh, Transformation Tuesday series, we have this uh, event tonight. And then after the event tonight, we are going to be next Tuesday live and in person at Bikettle, the uh, wonderful uh, biking class that's going to be indoors uh, right by our Southside office. So we're looking forward to doing that. That's at 9 a.m. Central Time next Tuesday. So uh, please register for that if you're going to join us for the uh, Bikettle biking class, an hour long ride. We promise we will not keep you the full hour on the bike, but we're gonna have a live DJ and we're gonna have a lot of fun with that. But as a lot of you guys that are joining us already know what we are trying to do at Exit every month is we have different segments related to health and wellness. So obviously this is health and wellness this month, personal finance, charity and community, and of course, real estate. But our big focus is trying to get you as to be as well-rounded as possible of a person. And I am not seeing yet uh, our good friend uh, on that actually introduced us to Dr. Koz, uh, Kozlowski at the beginning, but I uh, wanted to thank Alicia Bowens from our office for introducing us to the doctor. And uh, before we let him start, I wanna give you a quick bio on him. He has got a huge amount of credentials in the industry as a functional medicine MD. He's using a broad array of tools to find the body's source of the dysfunction. So taking time to listen to patients, plots their history on a timeline, considering what makes them unique. He is a working with patients online and in person in Chicago, Illinois and Bozeman, Montana based offices. So if you guys remember that last week I was in Montana to speak for Exit, what a beautiful big sky country there, but he is uh, Chicago based as well, uh, trained with clinics, uh, leaders in the field, and he recently published a book. This is a really cool thing for us to be uh, at Exit Strategy, a part of tonight. Recently published a book called Unfunk Your Gut. And that is talking about his patient first healthcare approach, the research style of it. And then also giving readers of the book practical strategies and delicious recipes. So if you're like me and always trying to better yourself, uh, we want to get some of those delicious recipes out of the book too. And we're trying to achieve true balance of body, mind, and spirit. So Dr. Kozlowski is just perfect for what we're trying to do here at Exit. And I wanted to go ahead and turn the presenter role over to him because he is gonna be taking it from here. And again, he is gonna be, uh, we're gonna be recording this session. It's already started. So as you uh, join us this evening, again, we are gonna mute you on the way in, uh, but uh, doctor, if you wanna go ahead and uh, start with your presentation, we're super excited to have you here tonight. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor to be here um, and speak with you guys. Spoiler alert, we're not gonna be talking about gas relief, um, at least that product. Um, we're gonna be talking, I'm gonna explain, I mean, so a little bit of my background is I was trained as a family medicine doctor. Um, I did my residency at St. Mary and St. Elizabeth Hospital uh, over by Ukrainian Village. And, uh, I was introduced to this thing called functional medicine. And I at first thought it was full of crap. I didn't really believe in it. It, it seemed like just basically alternative medicine. The way I was trained as a medical doctor was like medications, medications, medications. We're not focused on somebody's story. We're focused on their symptoms and what pills are gonna make them feel better. 
And through, I, I think, just luck, I, I just was in the right place at the right time. I was introduced to this concept of functional medicine. And the best way I could describe it is it is a search for the underlying cause of disease. And so when I, when I, I work with patients that um, their families bring autistic children to me, I work with elderly, I work with um, middle age, I work with uh, just everybody for any kind of chronic condition. Um, and so a lot of times we're starting with the gut. Like somebody comes to me with eczema and I'm telling them, we're going to look at your gut health. And they look at me like I'm crazy because they're like, I'm here for my skin. Why are you talking about my gut? And so that, that's why I wrote my book. Um, that's why um, I like to speak about it and explain it. Um, because a lot of people don't think about their gut when it comes to their skin or their autoimmune condition or their blood pressure. Um, and it's the key to everything. So that, that's what we're going to talk about. And I can definitely take some answers at, or excuse me, some questions at the end. Um, it is unfunk with a C. Um, and at my practice, we used to make, have t-shirts that say, we put the funk in functional medicine. So this, that's where the title comes from. And uh, that's the, what the cover looks like. So we're gonna start at the beginning. And it starts with Hippocrates 3000 years ago. They call him the grandfather of medicine. He said all disease begins in the gut. He did not have the kind of lab testing that I do. He, does, we, he just didn't have any of, of the things that we do. And somehow he knew the root cause of disease and what I always say is that ever since he said that, everything we've done is destroy our guts through the use of antibiotics, through all the stress that we have, through all the processed food, through all the sugar, the medications, all we've basically kind of gone in the wrong direction since he said that, like he knew it and we've basically screwed it up. So these are all the different concepts we're gonna get into and we're gonna start with the anatomy of the gut. So this is your gut. It is the tube, excuse me, um, that starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. It's made of your mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, pancreas, liver, and gallbladder are attached. So those are the different parts of your gut. Like I said, it is a tube with openings on both ends. And the most important thing I like to teach people about the gut is that the inside of this tube is actually considered outside of your body. So if you swallow something and you poop it out, it's never been in your body. And so some people have heard of that term leaky gut, and that's basically what we're gonna get into. It, your gut is a barrier. It is a barrier to decide what comes into your body and what stays out. The bloodstream is on the other side of this tube. So we digest food, we break it down into nutrients, and then we absorb the nutrients into our body um, in a healthy environment. So the way I think of the gut tube is like your skin, but the difference is, is your skin is very thick. There's three layers of cells. It's very thick, your skin. Your gut tube is a single layer of cells. It's very, very thin. So it's a lot easier for things to get in through the gut than it is through the skin. But people wash their hands 10 times a day uh, to keep themselves clean, and then they throw anything in their gut tube. Well, it's a lot easier for things to get in through the gut tube than it was through your hands. Um, so that, that's probably the most important point I want to make about it. And when you start thinking about it that way, I think it changes. Uh, it could change the way you eat and the way you treat it. My passion and um, what I drive my patients crazy with is the gut brain connection. And what I'm talking about is what I teach people is the most important part of your gut health is your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And when patients come to me, they want me to tell them what diet to follow, what testing to do, what supplements to take, what meds they want to take. But when I bring up the mental, emotional, and spiritual part, they usually shut down, tell me to F off. Like, we're not here to talk about that. And my response is, your gut will never heal if you don't focus on your mental, emotional, spiritual health. So I'm going to show you why that is. Some people call it the second brain. 
first brain, second brain, that tube that we're talking about, your gut tube, is surrounded by a nervous system called your enteric nervous system. That nervous system um, has more neurons than your brain does. So you have more nerve cells in your gut tube than you do in your brain. Um, and that nervous system maintains your barrier. So it keeps your barrier healthy to keep the toxins out. It regulates your immune response. Uh, it detects and allows you to absorb nutrients and it influences uh, the way you poop and how things move through your gut. That nervous system does not operate alone. It is connected to the brain by what is called cranial nerve number 10, your vagus nerve. Um, this is, there's 12 cranial nerves and they run through our, our brain and head. And then there's one that shoots down to the rest of our body and that's your vagus nerve. So if you picture the vagus nerve is basically like a highway of information. It carries information from the brain to the gut and from the gut to the brain. Um, so this is the gut brain connection, your vagus nerve. And your vagus nerve runs on your autonomic nervous system, which is automatic. Your autonomic nervous system is either firing in sympathetic response or parasympathetic response. Sympathetic is fight or flight. That is when you're trying to escape and survive. Your, the, when your sympathetic nervous system is activated, the blood and energy go to your brain and muscles to survive because your body, your, your mind thinks you're in a life or death situation. And if you survive that situation, the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, which then sends all the energy to your gut to digest. So you need both responses. You need one to rest and, and digest, and you need one to survive. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, and the analogy I give being in Montana is that if you're hiking in the mountains and you see a grizzly bear, the sympathetic nervous system is activated. And it's like, I need to figure out how to survive. So your digestion stops, uh, your gut becomes leaky, your gut bacteria become imbalanced, and you can develop a condition called SIBO, which I'll, we'll go into all of these concepts. Um, when you're in parasympathetic, you're digesting, your gut barrier is healthy, and your microbiome is healthy. People nowadays are living as if they're running from a bear 24-7. Most of us, the first thing we do when we wake up is check our phone. And whether that's uh, your email, your texts, your phone calls, the news, social media, for most of us, that's activating a sympathetic nervous system response. Your mind to start the day is telling the gut, we don't need you today, right? And then you, so you check your phone and let's say you have breakfast next. And while you're having breakfast, you've got the news on or you're on your phone or still responding to stuff. Your gut is saying like, hey, I got food in here. I need to break this down. Your mind is saying, we don't have energy. We, we can't waste time digesting food. We're in survival mode. And so people are, like I said, people are living as if they're running from a bear 24-7 and the gut will never heal. And this is how most gut issues start. Um, something that I, I learned a long time ago is a different de definition of trauma. And so most people think of trauma as um, violence or things like that. But the definition I heard of trauma is trauma is anything less than nurturing. And so it could be as simple as coming home from school and your parents, uh, you want to show off your homework, but your parents are working or they're busy. And that sets off a signal of I'm not good enough. And the first organ that gets affected is your gut. So for a lot of us, it starts when we're very young, but people don't end up in my office until they're 10 years old, 30 years old, 50 years old, 70 years old. But it all started with that sympathetic nervous response of I'm not good enough. This is a, a joke, but what happens in the vagus nerve doesn't stay in the vagus nerve. What, what happens there, everybody finds out. Um, the key to your gut health is to heal trauma, um, present moment awareness. Every patient I've ever met, I've recommended them to work with a therapist while they work with me. Exercise, sleep, prayer, meditation. Um, 
what that looks like is different for all of us. I, I think that the most important step is just creating awareness of like, hey, the stuff that happened with my wife or husband or what happened when I was 10 years old, all of this stuff can be affecting my physical health now. And so when you're aware of it, you can at least work on it. Most people don't even know that this is an issue. Um, but my experience is, is that the gut won't heal. So that's, that's my little soapbox on that. And now we'll get into the uh, other parts of the gut. And so when we chew food, it drops down the esophagus into the stomach. The stomach makes hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is how you digest protein, activate digestive enzymes, kill off bacteria, and absorb minerals. So you need lots of stomach acid. The seventh most prescribed drug in America is an acid blocker. If you walk into your local Walgreens, CVS, Costco, there's literally an entire aisle of acid blocking drugs. We take the polar opposite approach. A lot of times when I'm trying to help someone with their gut, the first thing we're doing is testing for low stomach acid. So I'm going to give that to you here, and it's also in my book in case you uh, want like a follow-up on it. Um, so the first thing is symptoms of low stomach acid, and this is what can really throw people off, because if you look at these symptoms, they look a lot like the symptoms of too much stomach acid. And you go to your doctor with these symptoms, and they're like, okay, here, take an acid-blocking drug, which is just going to make your original problem worse frequently. Um, so, and so low stomach acid is extremely common. I diagnose it uh, every day, pretty much. And uh, the number one reason that it happens, so these are causes. Number one reason is aging. 80% um, of people over 80 um, have low stomach acid. I see it in teenagers and kids and young adults and the cause is stress. And when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, your body says, hey, no time to digest right now, so you don't make acid. These are diseases that happen when you have low stomach acid for a long time. The most common disorder is low thyroid. Um, the rest of these are mostly immune disorders. And the reason your thyroid and immune system are so affected by low stomach acid is because your thyroid and immune system need vitamins and minerals to function. If you're not digesting, you're not going to be absorbing those nutrients and these systems will stop working properly. So like I said, your diet could be amazing, but if, if the stomach acid is low, you're not getting those nutrients and then these systems start to go wrong. So you can test yourself at home tomorrow morning. You, it's called the baking soda test. You mix a quarter teaspoon of baking soda into four ounces of water, mix it up and drink it first thing when you wake up. And when I first heard this, I thought it was kind of ridiculous. I thought it was a joke. Like the, this sounds like a little kid's uh, chemistry experiment of making a volcano. Um, that's what you're doing. Baking soda is basic. Your stomach should be acidic. So when you drink the baking soda, the base and the acid meet in your stomach and it creates an explosion, which presents as gas. And you should start burping within three to five minutes, typically three. If you don't burp, you probably have low stomach acid. And I tell my patients to, to do this test a few times. Um, it's not perfect. Um, so if somebody's working with me, I'll say do it three or four times in the next week and then let me know what happens if you burp or not. The way we treat low stomach acid is by supplementation. And that's just my general, general belief between what I do and what I was trained in originally is most of traditional medicine is run by the pharmaceutical industry. Our medical training is influenced by uh, big pharma. And so when there's a solution to a problem that doesn't involve a medication, usually your doctor is gonna be very confused uh, because we're not taught that. 
um, we're basically taught about medications. I had to spend a lot of time and money to learn a different way to look at medicine. Um, so hydrochloric acid comes in capsules. It looks just like a multivitamin or vitamin D. The two most important things to know about supplementing hydrochloric acid is number one, it's not normal to tolerate an HCL supplement. So somebody with normal stomach acid that takes extra acid is going to get reflux because your stomach's making it, you're putting in extra. So there's too much and it, you feel it in your throat. Somebody with low acid is going to feel better or not feel it when they take it. The most other most important thing is that it should only be taken before protein, meat, fish, eggs. Um, I do have vegetarians and vegans that take it. They just take less. Um, in the beginning, I really just like to start with meat, fish, eggs, if you're going to take it. So you take one and then you eat. You take it every time you eat throughout the day. So if you're eating three meals a day, you would take it three times a day. And so one pill you eat, if you don't feel it, that means you have low acid. So in that case, we want to figure out how deficient are you? So every two days, you try increasing your dose. You go from one to two, two to three. You can get as high as seven. Typically, at some point, you're going to feel reflux. Let's say you get up to three capsules, and that's when you're like, ooh, I feel it. Then your dose is two. And that's what you'll want to stay on until your body tells you don't need it. So that means that if your dose was two, all of a sudden, one day two will feel uncomfortable. And that's a sign that your body's making acid on its own again. But this is a crucial component that is, um, again, caused by what I think is the most common thing is stress that affects our guts, which then shuts down your stomach acid production, which then screws up the rest of your gut function. The next part's the small intestine. So food and acid pass from the stomach into the purple area of the small intestine. The small intestine is about 20 feet long. And this is actually where the majority of digestion happens. So food and acid go from the stomach into the small intestine. And when they're in there, the pancreas releases enzymes that help you break down fats, carbs, uh, and whatever proteins left over. Your liver makes bile. Bile is stored in your gallbladder. Bile goes in the small intestine and helps you break down fat. So in the small intestine, everything has been digested. This is where you absorb. 90% of absorption happens in the small intestine. There's 2,000 square feet of absorptive surface. So how do we turn 20 feet into 2,000? It doesn't really make sense. Your small intestine is lined with these little things called microvilla. This is what increases the surface area and turns 20 feet into 2000. Um, so there are these little finger-like out pouchings. They are responsible for absorption. So if you picture the top of the slide as the gut tube, this is where food is passing and being digested. Um, on the other side is your bloodstream. So things are broken down and then the good stuff should be absorbed into the body and the bad stuff should be excreted out in the poop. And what the good, the, the good nutrients should come in and the toxins should stay out. These are your different vitamins and minerals and where they pass from the tube into the blood. It's basically all happening in the small intestine. That's where basically everything you absorb is happening here in the small intestine. This is also where leaky gut happens. And this is a term you might, may or may not have heard of. It's a very trendy term. Leaky gut is simply when your gut barrier is lost. When you lose that function of allowing good things in and keeping bad things out. When you have a leaky gut, anything that's passing through your gut can get into your blood. It is now in your body once it's in your blood. What's waiting in your blood is your immune system. Your immune system is looking at like, okay, this is good, this is bad. You eat some vegetables and there's some vitamin B and D and, and C, your body's like, all right, come on in, support my body. But let's say you're being exposed to mold 
or you're being exposed to heavy metals, or there's glyphosate in your food, or there's other toxins in your food, there's lead in your water supply, all these, this, all the genetically modified food, you're eating too much sugar, all of that stuff gets in, and now your immune system's like, wait a minute, get out of here, and it attacks, and that creates inflammation in the blood. What happens with the blood? It goes everywhere, from your head to your toes. And so that is why when I'm working, when somebody comes in, whether they tell me their, their, knee, their knee hurts or they've been diagnosed with uh, Hashimoto's or lupus or whatever, that's why we start with the gut because the gut is how things got into the body. And that's how you can keep them out to start healing. And so every patient I work with presents with different symptoms but we're looking for the underly, underlying reason why. You, I showed you a picture of what a healthy gut looks like. This is a leaky gut. So all those microvilli that we saw are gone and there's just holes that let toxins into your body. Leaky gut is caused, all this stuff kind of, kind of is repetitive, but it is due to our uh, standard American diet, which we call the SAD diet. Um, stress, meds, toxins, low stomach acid, and then microbiome imbalances, which is what we're gonna look at last. The large intestine is the last part. And that's what I joke is my favorite area um, because that is where the three to five pounds of bacteria that live inside of you live. They live on the, the inside walls of the large intestine. And the, the term that a lot of people have heard is probiotics. Somebody who's taking a probiotic, the point of a probiotic is to grow more healthy bacteria in your large intestine. We're gonna talk all about the microbiome so you understand why it matters, why it's important. This is a comic, but this is what your large intestine should look like. It should be full of bacteria. Um, so the most important things to know about the gut bacteria is number one, your gut bacteria are alive. They need to eat to stay alive. They eat fiber. And one of the things we do in the SAD diet is we don't eat enough fiber. The like United States Preventative Task Force tells, I believe, women to eat 10 to 15 grams and men 25 grams of fiber a day. I have colleagues in my field who tell people to eat 100 grams of fiber a day. Um, it is the food for your bacteria. And if they don't eat, they die, and then the wrong stuff takes over. Um, the other reason we, the, the, the big reason we care about them so much is, um, sorry, this is taking a second. We have over 23,000 genes. They've done our human genome project and they found over 23,000 genes that influence uh, who we are and how we function. They've done stool tests and found over 22 million bacterial genes in your gut. So I have this t-shirt that I wear sometime that says mostly microbe, that we're mostly made up of bacteria. They talk to us. They influence your bones, your immune system, your nervous system, your arteries, your skin, your weight. So the gut bacteria literally influence everything. That's, that's why we care about them. Um, and like I mentioned eczema and I mentioned leaky gut and how inflammation gets into your bloodstream. What is your largest organ? It is your skin. So if there's a bunch of inflammation in your blood floating around, one of the easiest places for it to go is to your skin. Um, so that's like the frequent, like, I, I, I mean, I work with every kind of condition, but people are often like, I, I'm here to talk about my skin, not my gut. Well, you, if you've, you're coming to me, you've probably already seen your family practice doctor. You've probably seen a dermatologist. They've tried creams and pills and you're still in the same place and oftentimes worse because the underlying reason was not uh, checked. So we're going to talk about how you get your microbiome 
and then how you screw it up and then how you can test for it. A microbiome starts during a vaginal delivery. The vaginal canal is full of probiotics. During a vaginal birth, the infant picks up good bacteria, which make their way to the intestine, and that starts setting up our microbiome. Right now, one out of every three people are born by C-section. I don't know if you've ever seen a C-section, but basically the woman's stomach is ripped apart and the baby is pulled out by the nurse. They've, so you, the baby doesn't go through the vaginal canal. So they've done stool studies on babies born by C-section and they find the same bacteria that was on the delivery nurse's gloves growing in the baby's gut. So that, that, that's not good because most of the bacteria that are on a nurse's gloves are things that are around the hospital and not what you want to be, how, not how you want to be starting your life and your microbiome, because the first thing your microbiome influences uh, in those first couple of years is your immune system. And so if your immune system is getting all these weird signals from the age of zero to two, it, it's a poor prognosis for probably your long-term health. Then after, and then the other thing that happens is that every woman is now tested for group B strep before she goes into delivery. They test you like 48 hours before. If you're group B strep positive, which a lot of women are, they give you antibiotics during the delivery. What do antibiotics do? Kill bacteria. So that's going to wipe out the vaginal flora. So even if you are born vaginally, there was no bacteria to pick up. Then it's breast milk. The most important thing about breast milk is that it's full of pre and probiotics. So breast milk has those good bacteria in it. Mom is passing them to the baby. And then after you're done breastfeeding, it is your diet and lifestyle that influences your microbiome. How do we screw up our microbiome? The worst thing I think are antibiotics because what are antibiotics? They, were ta they are tablets that were designed to kill bacteria. Where do we put them? In a tube that has five pounds of bacteria in it. So taking antibiotics just once ever in your life can wipe out half of those five pounds of bacteria that you have growing. Um, stress, I can actually see how stressed out someone is on a stool test based on how their gut bacteria look. And I'll show you that. Um, diet, meds, it's kind of all the same stuff that I keep going back to that, that is uh, screwing up our guts. The analogy I really like to think about your microbiome is it is like your own garden. And in that analogy, the probiotics are the plants of your garden. Fiber is the fertilizer of your garden. What happens in your garden at home if you don't take care of it? Weeds grow right? If you spray your garden with a bunch of glyphosate or Roundup, these things are going to die. That's the equivalent of taking an antibiotic for your microbiome. So when weeds have overgrown your microbiome, that is called dysbiosis, when your gut bacteria are imbalanced. That could be due to things like yeast, like candida, which uh, some of you may have heard of, bacteria like clostridia, parasites. There's so many different things that I've found growing in people's microbiomes that are creating inflammation. When those ba dysbiotic bacteria or imbalanced bacteria are present, they send toxins into your bloodstream. And again, now the immune system is responding to those toxins and the inflammation spreads. So that, the, that is how dysbiosis can present as Hashimoto's or lupus or high blood pressure um, because those imbalanced bacteria are sending all this inflammation into your body and it spreads. Diseases that happen when you have low, or excuse me, imbalanced bacteria for a long time, depression, rheumatoid arthritis, um, IBS, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, autism, obesity, hypothyroid, hyperthyroid. It's basically any kind of chronic disease 
if you believe in gut health, which I do. The last topic that I wanna cover before testing is called SIBO. Um, SIBO is the most common condition that I treat when it comes to gut health. SIBO means small intestine bacteria overgrowth. These are some of the symptoms, bloating, belching, gas, pain, cramps, constipation, diarrhea, both nausea, food sensitivities. So those are all gut symptoms, but there's also systemic symptoms, headaches, joint pain, fatigue, skin symptoms like eczema, respiratory, asthma, mood, depression, brain fog. Um, I've worked with people, the majority of people I work with with SIBO do have gut symptoms, but I've I've also worked with a number of people with this point who only have the systemic symptoms. So in the beginning of my career, it would throw me off because I'm like, well, this person doesn't have any gut symptoms, so it can't be SIBO. That my experience has taught me differently. And simply what it means, small intestine bacteria overgrowth, is your microbiome has migrated up from your large intestine into your small intestine. And those bacteria are now living in a place where they should not. We talked about how these gut bacteria are alive and they eat when you eat fiber and some sugars is what they eat. So that's a great thing. And, and when they eat, it's an anaerobic process, which means without uh, oxygen. So when your gut bacteria eat, it creates gas. That is, again, a good thing. So if, you're, if you have a healthy microbiome, you eat a bunch of fiber and you get gassy, that's just your bacteria eating. You do not want your bacteria to be eating while they're hanging out in your small intestine because this is the area, as you remember, that nutrients are supposed to be getting in. You're supposed to be digesting. There's not supposed to be a bunch of bacteria and gas and toxins floating around in here. Um, that when you have SIBO, your small intestine looks like your large intestine. We looked at the symptoms. This is always an interesting thing is I always show people this list. So we've got garlic, onions, avocados, almonds, dairy products, apples, a lot of very healthy foods. These are some of the best foods unless you have SIBO. A patient, when they come in to meet me, fills out all this intake paperwork prior. And one of the, one of, there's an entire page about their nutrition and what they're eating. If somebody's writing down on there, hey, I noticed that I, I don't tolerate garlic or almonds or avocados. First thing that I'm thinking is SIBO. Um, why does SIBO happen? The number one reason is low stomach acid. When acid passes from your stomach into your small intestine, it helps bacteria from overgrow your small intestine. So again, my general belief for a lot of people is it started as trauma when we were kids, which the stomach acid wasn't being produced and now it created this more basic environment in your small intestine, and those bacteria will migrate up and they'll start taking over the small intestine. Um, medications, stress, diet, toxins, constipation. Um, I've worked with people where they're like, you know, I, I went on vacation, I got sick, um, my doctor gave me a course of antibiotics, and my gut's never been the same. So I've seen just one round of antibiotics set off SIBO. Um, so the testing, the last part of how do we figure out what is going on in your microbiome? The first kind of test that I run for your gut is, um, a stool analysis. And this is loading. A stool analysis, page one of it basically is a picture of what is growing in your garden. These are the plants. If you've ever taken a probiotic, most probiotics have lactobacillus and bifidobacterium in them. Um, these probiotics don't grow on a stool test when somebody is really st 
stressed out. So that's how I could see that somebody's under chronic stress because their bacteria won't grow in the stool. And then we test for the weeds. Do you have the wrong stuff overgrowing? That could be bacteria, that could be yeast like candida, and that could also be this long list of viruses and parasites. Um, these are all different bacteria, viruses, and then again, all these different parasites that we test for. Parasites are pretty rare, um, but I, I catch, uh, I'd say like five to 10 cases a year. Uh, the first time I did a stool test, I had parasites, I had no clue. Um, so uh, that's how we tell what is your garden healthy? Do you have the right stuff? If you have an imbalanced garden, like let's say you have some of these weeds, I don't know when they got there because people are like, well, when did this happen? It could have happened yesterday. It could have happened 40 years ago. I don't know. But if you're having symptoms or we're worried about something or we're just focused on preventative health, I would be getting rid of that. And the way we get rid of it is typically through a natural herbal approach that I, I take people through. It's different for everybody. Um, the other information that we get from the stool test is just general health markers about your gut. Um, and this is probably the second most important page. It assesses how well are you digesting and absorbing. So it looks at how well your pancreas is functioning. How inflamed is your gut? Secretory IgA is the best marker of leaky gut. If this is too low or too high, that's a marker of leaky gut. And then short chain fatty acids are what your bacteria produce when they eat. They've done studies and they found the higher your levels of butyrate, the lower your risk of dementia. So that is a the, the last thing that the stool test does that I think is uh, awesome is they found weeds in this person. Well, the lab does sensitivity testing. Um, you guys have probably heard of antibiotic resistance, right? We're, we're prescribing so many antibiotics that these bacteria are like getting smarter. They're like, okay, we're gonna figure out a way to survive. So that's what we test. We test the specific bacteria that's overgrowing, what kills it. And I always try to use natural antibiotics, things like berberine, black walnut, caprylic acid, uber ursi, oregano, grapefruit seed extract, silver, there's others. Um, but the lab will tell us, okay, this person can take all the silver in the world and they're not going to kill this bacteria, but if they take oregano oil, it's going to die. And then they also test antibiotics, but I haven't used antibiotics, honestly, for this and probably since the first year of my career 10 years ago. So I, I always try to use the, the natural approach. And it's typically a two to three month treatment, and we can usually get things turned around. So you could have had 40, 60 years of poor gut health, if you work hard, uh, follow dietary recommendations, take the supplements, and then work on your mental, emotional, spiritual health, I've seen it like completely turn around within a matter of months. So a lot of times, I, I mean, I work with parents and I, I talk about C-sections and I could just see the mom's face go white or, um, because it's like, oh my God, my baby had a C-section. Um, they don't have good bacteria. I've worked with people that are born vaginally breastfed. They still end up with a poor microbiome. It, it changes over time um, and it's never too late to turn it around. So there's always hope. The second test that I can order for someone is called organic acid testing. This is a urine test. We are measuring the metabolites of different things in the urine. Marker number seven is the marker of the breakdown of candida. So candida is a yeast that thrives under sugar and a suppressed immune system. So if you're on a high sugar diet um, or you're really stressed out, that causes cortisol to be released, which suppresses your immune system. Lots of sugar is present and yeast like candida love to survive. So 
We test for it in the stool, but it dies in the stool frequently. So we also test for it in the urine. The urine test gives us other information besides just your gut health. And that's why a lot of people like this test because the second thing it looks at is your Krebs cycle, which, it, which is what happens in your mitochondria, which are famously known as the powerhouse of your cells. So the mitochondria are most prevalent in our brain and in our muscles. The mitochondria get damaged from chronic inflammation. So we can actually assess how well your mitochondria are working. That is markers 22 through 32. We also look at neurotransmitters like dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin. Some people have neurotransmitters imbalances. A lot of times that can actually start as issues with your gut, diet, toxins, et cetera. So we get that information. We also see how well your body's using fat for energy. Um, the ketosis diet, keto is a very common diet now. It is basically when you are not eating carbohydrates and you're relying on fats to make energy. Carbohydrates are much easier to break down than fats are. Uh, that gets into like chemistry and carbohydrates are only six carbons long. So it's like a chain of six carbons. Fats are typically 25 carbons long. So fats are much longer. So it takes a lot more work to break them down. So if somebody's following a keto diet, they're eating things like coconut oil because coconut oil has medium chain triglycerides, which are the six carbon fats. So your body can turn those into energy more quickly. And that's why ketosis works for some people. It's not a diet that I frequently recommend because it's extremely difficult um, and there's easier alternatives, but a lot of people do do it. Um, we also get nutritional markers, B12, B6, B5, B2, vitamin C, vitamin CoQ10, N-acetylcysteine, biotin, um, and glutathione, which is your body's master antioxidant. And then we also look at amino acid metabolites. So those are the building blocks for your proteins. So we get all that information from your urine. The last test that I run is the SIBO test. And I think this is kind of the, the most interesting or coolest test that we do um, because what we are testing your breath. You are blowing into a tube every 20 minutes for two hours. And we are measuring hydrogen and methane gases. I told you your gut bacteria are alive. And when they eat, they create gas. That's why we're testing for gas. And in the first two hours, um, so what happens is to do this test, you drink this little, basically like a shot of lactulose, which is a sugar. That's one of the favorite foods of the bacteria. So that lactulose, after you drink it, is for the next two hours is passing from your mouth to your esophagus, to your stomach, to your small intestine. Those parts of your gut should not have enough bacteria present to ferment the lactulose. So these lines should be flat. If we were to extend this test out to three hours, which some doctors do it that way, Hour number two to three just tells us whether or not you have bacteria in your large intestine, which we all do, even if they're all screwed up. So a three hour test is pointless. All that matters is those first two hours when you don't want these lines to elevate. The sooner they start elevating, the higher up the bacteria are moving. That is SIBO testing. So that we, we test your stool, urine, and breath. Those tests are all tests that people do at home. Um, either you get them from our office or we ship them to you. You collect them. They come with a bag from FedEx and you send them off to the lab. And then when I get the results, we meet to talk about it. And that, that's kind of the end of my um, introduction to gut health. Um, 
This is my book. If anybody wants um, more information, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's on Audible. Um, and it's, it's an easy read. Um, I'm a very laid back person. I think we make things uh, too complicated with our health. I mean, obviously your health is complicated, but a lot of times I think we go overboard. Um, so I do have some humor in my book. And I mean, I have all the science and the research, but I also just, uh, uh, as someone who believes that mental, emotional, spiritual health is the most important part of the health, I don't want to stress you out any more than you're already stressed out. Um, so that, um, and like I, um, like we were saying at the beginning, I have an office in Chicago and I have an office in Bozeman. I, the overwhelming majority of the time work on Zoom. Um, that's kind of basically the only uh, good thing that happened to me during the pandemic is that I learned that I can do my job from Zoom. Um, and we're still having the same kind of outcomes we were. Um, but I also do like to work in person. Uh, it just varies where I am. Um, but if if this is a new world to you, um, and so he, we uh, we mentioned the the recipes at the beginning. Um, the recipes are tailored towards something called an elimination diet, which is a diet to diagnose whether or not you have food sensitivities. When your body reacts to food, you can be allergic, you can have celiac disease, or you could be sensitive to a food. If you go to your doctor and tell them, I think I'm sensitive to a food, they will do an allergy test. That's not what I'm talking about with food sensitivities. Allergies are due to IgE antibodies. Celiac is due to IgA antibodies. Sensitivities are due to IgG antibodies. Those are your chronic antibodies. And so the difference is when somebody's allergic to a food, they go into anaphylaxis very quickly, right? You start getting a rash, your throat closes, you can't breathe and you need a, an epinephrine shot to stay alive. The reaction happens right away. So you don't make it usually till 20, 30 years old without knowing you're allergic to peanuts, right? But you can live your whole life being sensitive to a food and never know it. And the reason that is, is because when the, a sensitivity happens, the reaction is delayed hours to days after eating that food. So the most common food that people are uh, sensitive to is gluten. Number two is dairy. Number three is soy. Number four is corn. Uh, number five is eggs. And number six is sugar. Those are kind of the top six. And let's say my sensitivity is to gluten. I wake up every day and I eat a bagel for breakfast. That's, that's my favorite breakfast. That's what I eat. I feel fine. I can have my bagel and go on with my day. But I start developing migraines. And I'm like, so I go to my doctor and I'm like, hey, I'm getting migraines. Um, what's going on? And the doctor's like, here, take this medicine to, to treat the migraines, right? Well, you're taking that medicine, but you're still eating the bagel right? And now that headache medicine screwed up your gut. And so you go back to your doctor and you're like, hey, I'm still getting headaches. And now my gut screwed up too. And they're like, okay, well, take an acid blocker. So now you're shutting down your digestion even worse. So now you've got headaches, gut issues, and your gut's not working. So you go back to your doctor and they're like, all right, you're nuts. I can't handle you anymore. Take an antidepressant. Right. That, that story uh, happens over and over and over the whole time through the story. I'm still eating the bagel. Right. And the bagels, what started my migraines. I have no clue. I have no clue. I will never have a clue that I'm having reacting to the bagel because it doesn't happen until hours or days after. And so the way you diagnose sensitivities is a 21 day elimination diet which is cutting out the top offending foods for 21 days and then adding them back in. 
I'm always a why person. Why 21 days? When I first heard that, sounded like a made up number. Everything in your body has a half life. And what that means is the clearance time, how long it takes you to get rid of things. So if you drink alcohol, um, if you take prescription meds, your hormones, toxins, everything has a different clearance time. The half-life of IgG antibodies is about 21 days. So if I ate a bagel today and I have a hundred antibodies floating around, if I completely avoid gluten for the next 21 days, my immune response will cut in half to 50. And then when I eat it again on day 22, the immune system will remember and attack. And that's, you diagnose yourself with a food sensitivity. And that is in my book, we have 50 recipes that you can make uh, during an elimination diet. They were written by one of my patients who's a chef who's been in remission from rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the kind of rheumatoid arthritis that she was on these nasty immunosuppressive drugs like methotrexate and injections and all this stuff. She hasn't been taking a, a medication in seven years, um, just through diet. Um, it's not that easy for everybody, but I see it happen. And, and, it, and to me, it's worth a shot than trying to go on these meds that are going to cause you to go on other meds and et cetera. So that an elimination diet is, is really the best way to start healing your gut. Um, there's an entire chapter explaining the whole process again, and then also the recipes. Um, uh, we've made all of them. They're, they're very good. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, to eat on elimination diet, but it's very worth it if you're having any kind of chronic issues. So that is uh, the end, and I, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has none. Just unmute yourself and, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Hey, Jack, um, I do have just a quick question. Um, I know every health plan, every insurance plan um, is different, but in your experience, do insurance plans or, you know, employee health plans um, typically cover um, the test and everything that you spoke about tonight? Typically not, not yet. Um, mo well, if you have like an HSA, yeah, 100% you're good. But if you submit a lot of these tests to uh, Blue Cross or Aetna or whatever, the lab has like totally different pricing. So for example, I, I'm always like very upfront. I, I just give the cost straight up, up, up front so you know what you're dealing with. It, a stool test, right? We looked at that stool analysis. If you send it to your insurance company, they are going to charge your insurance company like two and a half thousand dollars. Your insurance company is going to look at that and laugh and send you the bill and say, hey, you owe this lab two and a half thousand dollars. They have completely different pricing for me as a physician. And that, that's what I give to my patients. So um, a stool test is around $350. A urine organic acid test is $289. And the SIBO test is like $230. So um, you know the cost up front. And one of the things that I, I kind of joke about is functional medicine, what I do is the worst business model in America because people come in and they will spend more money on the first day. But I don't have return customers. My, my patients typically work with me for three months, six months, and they're frequently the issues will go away, or at least they understand how to keep them away. So they don't need me anymore. Um, so whereas in traditional medicine, we get you sick from a very early age, get you on medications, and then keep you alive as long as possible and just keep loading up more and more meds. And there's endless profits. Um, so that, that's kind of why I think that functional medicine will never be the mainstream medicine 
um, there's just not enough money in it for the pharmaceutical industry that kind of controls everything. Um, so you can try to bill. I, I, when I first started my career, everybody was like, I want to use my insurance. I was like, yes, let's bill this to your insurance. They're going to pay for it. And then people started getting these huge bills. And I was like, okay, I, I don't want to be uh, like, I didn't know it was going to be like this. So now for most of my career, for most of these tests, um, I've advised people to keep insurance out of it. Um, and I always tell people, some people come to me and they're like, I want to do all your functional medicine tests. I've been sick for 30 years. I don't care. Um, and I just want to get it all done. Some people are like, well, I can afford one test at this time. Which one would you recommend? And so that, that, that'll be where we'll start. Um, so that, that's my honest answer about that. This is Hugo, Doc. Hey, Hugo. How much does physical exercise uh, play into this? It play, I mean, it plays a huge role in this. Um, for me, I, I correlate physical exercise to my mental, emotional, and spiritual health. If I, I typically work out every day, um, basketball is my favorite thing. I play pickup basketball and uh, the weight room. Um, if I get an injury and I can't work out even for a few days, I start noticing the difference in my mental health. When my mental health starts falling apart, my gut starts falling apart and just nothing works. Um, when it comes to exercise, different things work for different people. If you're just getting started, an early goal is just 20 minutes of walking. Um, to me, ideal, and there's so many different opinions on when it comes to exercise, um, I typically recommend three days of weight training and three days of cardio. But there's, you know, it's different for everybody. You kind of find what works for you. Like not everybody likes to play pickup basketball the way I do. Um, you know, some people, I used to be a runner when I was younger. I don't really like just go out and run anymore. Um, but I think that exercise is a huge part of mental health, which in turn affects your gut health, which then in turn affects the rest of your physical health. Exercise is also going to keep some of the weight off um, which is going to help your body not be inflamed. Jonathan, Eve, I think you had questions. So thank you, Dr. Kaz. This was amazing. Um, and I just dropped some questions in the chat box. I copy and paste because I was taking questions down. So you explained what leaky gut was. Uh -huh. I want to be healed. And then the heartburn question, I think I may, if it's something, if it's what I think it is, I probably get it once every 18 months. But is that if it's where it feels like a something coming back up, usually after something spicy and you, you can feel it in your throat, that's heartburn? Yes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, just had to make a little joke. We we all give Eve heartburn as our managing broker every day, I think. Uh, Shana, you had a question as well? Well, I had a couple. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. You go ahead and finish. I'm so sorry. Is eczema related to dairy? And also, if you can explain again how bad bacteria eats fiber, because you mentioned it, but I think I missed it. How does... Yeah, so eczema can definitely be related to dairy. Um, kind of actually what's more common um, is the story of kids that get uh, recurrent ear infections, or at least they're being diagnosed with ear infections. That to me is typically a, uh, a sign that someone, a kid is reacting to dairy. So, um, I would, and, and so whether it's eczema or it's migraines, or it's back pain, or it's depression, or brain fog, or insomnia, I would definitely start with um, an elimination diet, finding out if you are sensitive to dairy. Um, and then your other question it was, is the, it's not just the bad bacteria, it's also the good bacteria that eat fiber. It's the good and the bad. And you want to have healthy bacteria to eat that fiber. You don't want um, 
unhealthy bacteria to be eating the fiber. And that's why you have to pull those out. Like the analogy I used to pull the weeds out. Uh, question, doctor. Have you heard of angioedema? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. It, it's basically kind of like a, a swelling um, in the blood vessels. Um, but that, I don't, that, that could uh, kind of um, maybe a topic for another day. Uh, it, it would get, um, uh, I think, um, yeah, if you, maybe if you can email me after and we could talk about it a little bit more. Um, if that's something that you're dealing with, um, uh, we can try, I can try to help. I've already downloaded your <laughs> audio book too. So. Oh, thank you. I, have a question. I wouldn't want to listen to myself for five hours, but, but a lot of people have liked it. I have a question. Does chewing gum affect anything with your gut? Uh, yes. Um, I think it depends on, you know, the, the problem is, is, is gum typically has a lot of that fake sugar in it. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, the fake sugar is, is worse than real sugar. So I, I would rather like when it comes to like pop, I would rather have somebody drinking regular pop than the diet stuff. Um, and I think most um, gums are made with that, but it's also not a huge quantity. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I don't, I don't ever tell people to avoid gum as a way to heal their gut. Um, I don't recall a specific study of like gum chewers versus not. That's something I probably uh, should look up, but it's not something that I, I worry about um, in regards to, you know, if, if you like to chew gum, uh, I don't think it's a huge deal. Okay. And what about like uh, flavored waters, uh, whether it's um, sugar substitutes in there or not? Yeah. So like bubbly right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, we don't, that, that stuff has not been around long enough for us to know the effects of it. Um, my wife was drinking pop when we first met. And one of the ways we got her off was by drinking bubbly. Um, but then we've kind of gotten off of that too. It, it you know, it, it says on the can, just natural flavors, Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. I, I honestly don't know what, what that exactly means of what those, because you can't just take like a strawberry and squeeze it into water and it's going to taste like a strawberry bubbly, like it, it's not all natural. So it, my general opinion is usually takes us 40 years to really understand how, how something's going to affect people long-term. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I'm Polish and uh, my parents grew up drinking mineral water. I thought it was nasty when I was growing up. Now it's like, all I like to drink um, is like club soda. Um, it like the actual mineral water that has like uh, minerals in it, like magnesium and potassium is, is definitely preferred. Um, but if we're transitioning from somebody that's drinking pop, trying to get off of it. I think bubbly is a good like transition. I don't think it's going to turn out to be a good option. Uh, you know, once we learn more about what's actually in it, um, and how it's affecting us. Um, but I do think it's better than, than pop. Um, just, we don't know, maybe, maybe we'll find out it's totally fine. I, I don't know. Okay. And, and what is your take if you do have an opinion on alkaline water? I don't think it really does anything. Um, I, I, I've seen studies that it, it, it doesn't really do anything. I mean, so we talked about the gut anatomy and your gut should be acidic mm -hmm. and your blood should be more alkaline and basically inflammation, like it's gut toxins, or if your body's reacting to dairy or environmental toxins like mold, those kind of inflammatory things create acidity. So you want to create a more basic environment, but I'm just not really convinced that it survives getting through your stomach, which is so acidic 
Um, and then your, your large intestine is where the water is absorbed. So I feel like the value is lost. Um, that's, I don't think it's really worth it. Um, but I know that there's a lot of good marketing behind it and it's, it's been very trendy. Um, so that's another one I might be wrong on, but I, I don't think it, it really helps anything. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Guys, we have time for one more question while I throw out my alkaline water. <laughs> Aerobic against uh, weightlifting, which is better? This is Hugo. Uh, both. I think it should be an even mix of both. I, I think you should do half and half. Okay, thank you. Too much of anything is not good. So mix it up. So Hugo. this was a question, more of a comment. Um, this was years ago, just out of the and I'll make it very quickly. I had these joint pains that radiated literally from every joint, fingers, elbows, shoulders, and... Um, like a redness of so the butterfly thing. So they tested me for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Yep. They won't tell you that you don't have it. What they will say is the test results came back negative. And now you have me thinking that maybe it was a food allergy because it never came back. Yeah. Like, it was just like a stretch and it went away and never came back. And I've been, I've been unable to identify it. So it's thank good. You. It went away and never came back. That's, that's the best thing you got going for you. Yeah, but it could be a food thing for sure. Oh, I know we're wrapping up. I'm sorry. This is Cassandra. Hello. Hi, doctor. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, super cool. I saw that you went to the Kanye concert during the NBA All-Star Weekend. Super dope. It was um, the last concert I went to until we went to Justin Bieber a couple of weeks ago. I've, I've been following your page, so you definitely have, have done a good job of balancing stress in life. So kudos to you <laughs> and your wife. <laughs> um, I had a question about colonics. How do you feel about colonics? Uh, another one that, that's kind of promoted as a health thing that I don't think is too great. Um, okay. It, it's basically like shooting a bunch of water up your butt. <clears throat> Um, to basically kind of flush things out. Um, as someone who focuses on the health of someone's microbiome, I'm pretty sure that all that pressure from a colonic is killing off your bacteria, um, which maybe is a good thing if you have the bad bacteria overgrowing. Um, but if we don't know what's going on in there, I would rather test your microbiome, find out what's going on and follow it that way. I do know that people feel better and swear by colonics. So I don't, I mean, I always meet my patients where they're at. If somebody tells me like, listen, like the only way I feel good, I can follow five things you tell me, but the sixth thing has to be colonics. I'm like, I don't care if you're feeling good, do them, you know? But I, I from a microbiome standpoint, I think they might do more harm than good. Got it. Thank you for the feedback. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Great question, Cassandra, and congratulations on your personal news. So we're going to hopefully celebrate you soon. Um, we have one more question. Yes, yes. Want... <laughs> yeah. We have one more question that Karen asked that actually I think probably is on several people's minds. How and where can we get an appointment with you, Dr. Kaz? My website, um, doc-kaz.com. I can put it in the chat. Um, and you can call uh, my assistant, her name's Jasmine, spelled with a Y, uh, but it's pronounced Jasmine. Um, she is fantastic. Uh, she answers the phone. She gets people's questions answered, gets scheduling, um, and also helps people while they're working with me, helps implement diet and understanding the supplements and understand uh, how to do the test. So she's a rock star um, and, that's through our website, emailing us or calling her is the best way to get a hold of us. Yes, Jasmine is amazing. This is Alicia. Um, I'm actually seeing Dr. Kaz right now. Thanks for coming on. Yes, yeah. I, I love Jasmine. So yeah, she does answer most of the time, even when she shouldn't. So yeah, she does. I, I, yell, I yell at her all the time when we used to work only in the office. We use a, a just like a cell phone for the office phone. And 
she takes it home and she's answering it from bed. And I'm like, I used to make her leave it in the office. So I'm like, you can't be working all night and all morning. Um, but she's great. Um, she really cares and um, is a, a great resource. I'm very lucky to have her with me. Well, and Alicia, thank you again for being the person that spearheaded this. Um, we're really, really happy that you did. Dr. Cause, this was amazing. Um, in addition to his website, his Instagram is doc underscore cause. So that's D-O-C underscore K-O-Z. Grab the book. And uh, we are really looking forward to getting this recording up on YouTube. We'll send it out to everybody that attended. And uh, definitely send this on to your database, my friends, because this was really incredible information. So again, everyone, thank you so much for being here tonight. We will see you um, next Tuesday live as Hugo asks about the cardio and all that good stuff. We're going to be doing some of it next Tuesday, 9 a.m. Uh, so invite your friends. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks again. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you all. This is thank great. You. Thank you. Thanks, guys.